I would just um, add a house rule and say, hey, in our house, we keep our bodies to ourselves, and then talk about personal space. So if he wants to be closer to his brother, you know, what does he have to do? And break it down step by step. So first you, you know, say, you know, hey, can I get past you or something, right? Then you have to wait for the brother to say, yeah, sure, or for the brother to move. Um, and Or you can walk around them if they say no. Uh, and then just talk about how we keep bodies to ourselves. And um, if it's a situation where, like, he's frustrated, um, you'll have to address that a little bit different. But if it's just, like, in passing that he's always bumping into each other, I would just do a little bit more body awareness and talk about house rules about personal space. Um, so instead of, okay, my first thing I always say is, instead of asking her to do it, make sure you're using an assertive voice. So instead of saying, hey, can you, or will you, it's, it's time to do blank. It needs to sound like a fact, it's not optional, right? You may still get pushback for a while, so don't take it as like the magical cure, there, there aren't any of those, right? Um, but you can just try to change your verbiage to, it's time to blank. Don't put an okay at the end or say please or thank you. It's just, it's time to do blank. And then you can follow up with two positive choices if you want to add something on to the end. Like, do you want to do this by yourself or do you need a little help to get started? Or um, do you want to walk there or tiptoe there? Something like that. So that the two choices, it's not a trick and you're still making it clear that this is what we are doing. Um, and if she says something like whatever at the end still, just ignore it because the more attention you give to it, the more often it's going to happen. Instead, you can validate her feelings of not wanting to do it because that's what her whatever is telling you, right? So you can say, I understand that it's hard to do something that you don't like doing. It's hard for me to do things that I don't enjoy too. The sooner we get done, the sooner we can go to blank or the sooner we can do this other thing. Sometimes, yes. It depends on their age, for sure. And I'm hesitant to use the word manipulative because children do things that get them what they were hoping for, right? It's kind of like a trial and error. We use a credit card and a credit card machine because we know that that gets us what we need. It's an exchange. So think of behavior as communication in the same way. So that, that way you can reframe the way you're thinking about it. That's a part of the conscious parenting approach where you're reflecting on your own, like, beliefs and things like that um, and like the way you're viewing a situation because when you think of your kiddo as being manipulative that can sometimes frame the way you're going to respond to them in a little bit more negative way which is what we don't want we want to be calm cool and collected as much as possible um, not possible all the time because we're human too um, but it does mean that in some ways that behavior is getting them what they were wanting so really reflect on why they're doing it. Like, what are they hoping for, right, behind that um, persistence or the way that they're talking about things? What are they getting out of that? Um, and how are you maybe negatively impacting that or, like, making the behavior continue? Um, I would really look at how consistent you are, and if you have a co-parent, how consistent you both are. If you say something, you need to mean that something. And then make sure you're using positive phrases as much as possible. That means eliminating or rarely using things like no, stop, and don't. You're going to literally paint a picture for what you want from them. So, for example, instead of don't run or no running or stop or quit, um, you're going to say something like, when we're inside, our feet need to walk to keep us safe. You can walk by yourself or I can help you use walking feet. Something like that. Um, just so that you're literally reframing the picture in their head. If you just say stop, it doesn't tell them what to do, which I know seems self-explanatory, but that's because our brains are more developed than a child's brain. And the way that their brain works and processes language isn't fully developed yet. Don't go to Arby's. Or maybe tell them, you know, when we're out, we're going to go to Arby's. Would you like to bring a snack when we go to get Arby's? Because I know you don't like it. That way you're showing them that you respect their decision to not eat it, but that they might be a little bit hungry because a snack isn't a meal. So I try not to use the word defiant, kind of for the same reason I don't like to use words like manipulative. It has a negative connotation. Instead, try to think of your kiddo as really persistent and strong-willed. They know what they want. 
and they're going to do what they feel is necessary to try to achieve that, right? Um, because remember that if you view them as defiant, your actions, your words are going to come off a little bit negative anyway because you're slightly irritated or annoyed. So instead I would pause when something happens, um, I would pause, take a breath so that you can be composed and just um, use a matter of fact tone. It's not um, like demanding and it's not being mean or anything and it's also not being passive. So like I had just mentioned to someone earlier, instead of saying like, um, it's time to do blah, 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 like think about your tone when you're saying it or like do it now or else that's not going to work well. Um, but it's also not going to work if you say things like, will you please or can you or please do this for me. Those are both ends of the spectrum, passive and aggressive. So you need to find that assertive tone um, to be most beneficial and then follow up with two positive choices. Um, I know it seems like a lot, um, but it takes about two weeks before you see lots of progress with it if you stay consistent every day, every time. Uh, so that would look like, um, okay, so you said defiant, believes he has an authority issue. So if he's told no, he goes crazy. Don't tell him no. Instead, frame it positively. I hear you want that. Right now we're doing this. Or I hear you want that. Tomorrow we'll have another chance to use it or to have it or whatever the case may be. So you're still not giving that something because it's not a choice, right? But you're just saying it slightly different and it'll make his brain work in a little bit different way because brains create this these neural pathways. And if no triggers him to kind of like blow up, we're going to try to avoid that so that he can create a different neural pathway to try to problem solve a little bit more. And you're going to help support him through that. Yeah, so really just try rephrasing the way you say it because maybe it's coming off as oppositional or defiant because they're seeing the way you're saying it as a threat. Sometimes it's about the way something's perceived, even though you didn't mean for it to sound a certain way. So try being extremely intentional with the way you're saying it so your tone is matter of fact. And then if you're still getting that opposition, you can even have a family sit down and just say, hey, when I use this voice, it just means this is something that we're doing. And I don't want it to sound like I'm trying to boss you around because I'm not. I was just letting you know what's next in our day or what's expected during this piece of the day or something like that. And I hope you can understand. Or you wanted dessert remember you already had it or remember desserts after dinner dinners at blank time do you want to set a timer or do you think you'll be okay without it so did you hear how I set I set the boundary I didn't say no stop don't none of that I kept my tone firm but loving and um, I also offered two choices do you want to set a timer so you know when dinner will be so you know when that desserts coming or do you think you'll be okay with no timer? So the choice was timer or no timer. The choice wasn't dessert, right? Um, so it's just having some of the, those choices on standby in your head so that you can use them when you need them. So if they're constantly fighting with each other, I'm gonna assume that means like physically fighting because you didn't say arguing, but like a physical fight. You're gonna want to restate some of those family rules. So maybe having them written down because they're 10 and 12 have them written down in like a list format somewhere. But remember, it's not a no stop don't rule. It's a this is what we do. It might be be respectful, be kind, be helpful, be responsible. Those would be great rules. And then what does that mean, right? And then you have this family meeting and you define it together. What does it mean to be responsible? Would that mean picking up after yourself? Would that mean doing your chores when you're asked to do them or when you're scheduled to do them if you have like a certain day or time that they do that? Um, things like that and do that for each rule and make it more of a conversation so it's not a lecture piece and then you're gonna make sure that keeping bodies to yourself and using words instead of hands or you know whatever's happening um, is a piece of those rules and maybe your rule is to be safe or maybe that's part of be respectful or being kind or being helpful it could fit into any of those categories um, just depending on how you define it within your family and then right before they go to like play or be in the same space where the fighting typically happens, I would like give a little sit down or like a precursor and just say, hey, I've noticed you guys are fighting a lot when you are in really close spaces together or when you're in this room together. 
And remember that our rule is this. If you choose to fight with each other, neither of you will be able to stay in this room because it's not respectful or whatever the rule is. So you're stating the rule and the expectation before an incident happens. That way you're giving them an opportunity to be successful. And then if it does happen, you're going to just be matter of fact and say, it looks like you guys chose to fight, so you're choosing to go into separate spaces. I can come talk to each of you in just a couple minutes. Why don't you, you both go cool off. You can go in this room, you can go in that room and be very definitive about where you want them to be and what they can do there while they are cooling off. Um, and, and then you're going to go talk to both of them and say, you know, tell me about what happened so that you're not being judgmental and you're helping teach them what they could do instead because maybe something did happen and they irritated each other and they chose to fight instead of a healthier alternative. Sometimes with sensory disorders, um, and remember I'm not a doctor, so definitely talk to your pediatrician first and they'll definitely have some great resources for you as well because um, my advice isn't clinically based, so just um, remember that part. Um, but with sensory disorders, sometimes it's different for every kiddo. So it may be specific senses or it might be all, it might be when um, senses are understimulated or overstimulated. So I think I would need a little bit more to answer that effectively. But if you don't know like which it is for each of the senses, I would kind of maybe start doing some observations, even taking notes about it, just like small tally marks or something. Um, so you're knowing what things are triggers for your kiddo and what's going on with them first so you know how to help them cope and work through that. This is a great question and I get asked this actually quite a bit. Okay, I find myself saying please before giving instruction to model manners. Is that considered passive? Yes. So here's why though, because it is important to model manners, like super important. But where we get hung up is we do it when we're giving directions and directions are not a choice, right? Um, so you model pleases and thank yous and your manners when they're allowed to say yes or no. So like, hey, could you please pass the salt or the pepper, right? It would make your life easier if they passed it to you, but do they have to? No, right? And then when they do it, thank you so much. That was so helpful. That meant I didn't have to get up and go around the table to go get it. Thank you. Um, so you model them in different ways. It's really about being intentional with when you do this. Um, this used to be something that I do, I did a lot in my classroom when I was teaching preschool. Um, and I had someone come in and they were like, oh, you actually do that a lot. And I was like, no, because um, I thought I was pretty intentional about it. Um, so instead, when you give a direction, it should sound like it's time to, or this is what we're doing next. And instead of saying, okay, or will you please, or it's time to do this, please. You can add something if you feel like you just need to. You could say like, it's time to wash your hands. You can walk there or tiptoe there. Do you understand what we're doing? And then you're getting a back and forth exchange too. So I did a lot of, do you understand? Or did you hear my words? So it's not, do you understand me? It's not um, this like yucky thing. It's just, hey, did you understand what I said? And if they say no, usually they say no because they don't want to do it. And you just say, oh, okay, I'm glad I asked. Now I can say it again so that I know you understand it or that you hear me. Model manners in other ways and at other times, but not when you give directions. And I do have three videos at the very beginning of my TikTok page also um, that are about tones of voice. I would just have a discussion about um, like that these are private parts and that only you can touch your own body in that way and where is that appropriate to do like you know when you're using the bathroom when you're washing your body things like that um, and I would just address it that way and just say this is my private body and um, you're not allowed to touch my body without my permission and and then you can go over like personal private areas and things like that I'm guessing that you may be talking about like being overstimulated then it depends on in a group setting like at school or what because if he does have um, like an IEP or something, you could talk to his teacher and his providers uh, to see what things they can put in place as far as accommodations, like whether he gets mini breaks, where he puts on like a set of noise-canceling headphones or something, but it depends on 
what is overstimulating him? Is it noise? Is it people touching him, like brushing up against him, moving by people, things like that? It really depends on what's going on. Start by reviewing your house rules, and if you don't have defined rules, make sure you set those up, and like I said previously, make sure you're stating them in a positive way. So it's not, we don't break, it's we use gentle hands. And if it's not your item, like if it's like a vase or something like that, if it's not yours, then it's not a toy to play with, right? Toys are for playing, other things, you need to ask permission and use gentle hands. Um, so you're really defining what you do expect to happen. And then if and when something does get broken, don't really react and just say, oh, it looks like something broke. Remember, gentle hands, do you wanna clean it up yourself or do you want help? Or if it's something that's actually dangerous for them to clean up, find a way that they can contribute in a safe way because it is their responsibility to help clean up a mess that they made. But again, not in a demeaning way or anything. It's just, it looks like there's a mess now. When we make a mess, we clean a mess. Or when we make a mistake, we fix the mistake, right? How can we fix this or work through this together? I do have all of my book recommendations are on my website. So if you go to my website that's linked in my bio, and you hover over the about section, there's a second thing that says product recommendations and all the book recommendations are there. My absolute favorite though is The Whole Brain Child by Daniel Siegel. It really helped me understand like the biology behind the choices that we make, not just kiddos, but like ourselves too, so that it helped me be more reflective because I knew what was happening with my brain in those moments when I was getting flustered and it helped me have more patience with kiddos when you know they're having those moments too so I understood what was actually happening and it helped me gauge my response great question and people think that there has to be a certain age start it as early as you possibly can just be intentional with your choices and things like that in words and your facial expressions you're gonna obviously use a way more simplistic method for an infant and you're gonna use way less words and focus on facial features and hand gestures like if a toddler, like before they start talking, if they hit you for something, it's because they can't communicate with words yet, right? Or if they cry, frustrated or sad, mad. <sighs> Breathe. What do you need? Can you show me? Show me. You know, things like that for that age range just before they can speak. For smaller infants, you're going to need to be very reflective and observant because they can't communicate with you other than, you know, crying and things. Um, so you're going to need to really be reflective of what you're contributing to the situation because your stress level is going to make it worse. So even if something's happening, as long as your kiddo's safe, stop and take a breath, observe what's happening, reassess the situation. Remember, behavior is just a form of communication. So if she's scratching and pulling at people's faces, maybe it's because she has an unmet need. So remember, at that age, there's not a ton of communicating that your one-year-old's doing that's verbal that you'd be able to really understand why because they may not even know fully why they're doing that behavior. But some, some need may not be getting met or maybe when she scratches and pulls, it changes the way your face looks, right? Because if you scratch and pull, it changes the way that part of your face looks, which is interesting to young children. It's like, whoa, I've never seen a face do that before. Like, wow, that's interesting. So they may laugh or giggle or do it again because every time they do that, if their fingers or their hand is in a different placement, it's gonna move your face in a different way, which is interesting. Right, so try to think of it like your one-year-old's not trying to injure people, but maybe it's because it's interesting to look at, right? So try not to react a lot because I know that that probably really hurts. And instead, keep hands down, like help her keep her hands down. Say, hands stay down, gentle, gentle. And you're gonna take her hand, gentle, gentle on your face. And then do it to her, still with her hand, with yours, gentle. That's nice. So you're focusing attention on what you do expect. And then if it still happens after like maybe a week or so, give her something she can scratch or something she can pull safely under your supervision. Oh, I see you need to scratch something. Here you go. You may not scratch me. You can scratch this. Or you may not pull my face. You may pull this, right? Um, and give something that's appropriate for her age that can be safe for her. Well, does 
seeming like they're complaining get them more attention from you? My initial response would be maybe it's gaining them some attention. Because sometimes kiddos don't care if it's positive or negative attention. They just see it as time and attention from you. So I would maybe evaluate when it's happening. Or maybe it's when it's during a non-preferred activity, something they don't like. But I, I kind of have a feeling it's probably about attention. Because maybe, you know, there's more back and forth exchanges or something along those lines. Maybe it gets them out of doing something that they didn't want to do for longer because there's back and forth exchanges. So I would maybe reflect on the way you're responding when it happens. And then um, for future moments, when your kiddo says like, oh, I don't want to, or this sucks, or you know whatever they're saying, you can just say, I hear you. It's really hard to do things that we don't want to do. It's time to do this. And then move on. So you're not really giving much back and forth, and it's not a negotiation. You're validating their feelings, saying you know this is hard and it's hard to do things that you don't want to do. This is what we are doing. Right? So how can you say that in a way that doesn't turn into a power struggle, though? So then you could offer two positive choices, too, depending on what you what the situation is, right? So two positive choices could be a choice of an amount of time when it has to get done. It could be like beating the timer or something, or how long the timer gets set for um, to complete a task. Um, maybe it's a choice of movement. How are you going to move to get there, A or B? Um, it could be a choice of a color of, you know, a tool that they use for whatever, um, like if it's a toothbrush or, you know, something like that or a hairbrush or something. Um, but there's lots of ways around the complaining, but don't draw a lot of attention to it. Just move on as quickly as possible. You're going to validate those feelings, restate the boundary, and offer two positive choices whenever possible. You have to do that every time and not give that attention to the complaining very much, like, like in the way that I said. You have to be very consistent with that for about 8 to 14 days-ish. I always tell people about two weeks because there are some kiddos that are very persistent. Um, so that means every situation, every time you're responding in a similar way to really start to see any improvement. Reflect for sure on how you're telling her to do it. And then I would even maybe say, hey, I kind of noticed when, like have a little sit down powwow in like a informal way. And just say, like, I noticed when when I give you a direction, you kind of don't say much or it, it seems like you're uncomfortable. What can I do to help you be more comfortable when there's a direction or something that has to be done? So that way it's a back and forth exchange. Or you could do something like, hey, this has to get done soon. When would be a better time for you? In two minutes or in five minutes to get that started? That way you're giving her a little bit more choice and that might help with the anxiety piece. So it's not right now we're doing this, drop what you're doing. It's, hey, when would be a good time for you and she has a choice before the event. That is a great question. Uh, I do have a video about that actually, about going from like co-sleeping or sleeping in to trans, excuse me, to transitioning to sleeping in your own bed. Um, I would maybe check that out and then follow up with me if you have more things you need clarity on. Kids aren't gremlins, but they do need to know how to use their social and emotional skills. We aren't just born with them. They, they need to be taught, and everyone has different skill sets, right? Just like some people might be better at math, some may prefer science. Social and emotional skills are the same way, but we as a society tend to just think that we should inherently know them, and that's not the case. And there are some children that really struggle, and they do need to be taught in a more explicit, like, intentional manner than other children. And it's just because it's a skill set that doesn't come as naturally to them. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think there are some societal differences, even from, like, community to community. Um, yeah, but in general, there are lots of different parenting styles and strategies out there. What I'm talking about is a strategy called conscious parenting and gentle parenting which um, there's a lot of books and things out there, but they all say slightly different things. So I'm here just to kind of, um, I don't know, take away the confusion and say it in a more simplistic way and give some real life examples. Because most of the time these books tell you the strategy, but they don't tell you what to do when your kiddo says no. 
or when your kiddo gives that pushback because that's a normal human thing that will happen and it's really hard to navigate because you're like, I, I did the, the things that I was supposed to do and now, now I'm lost, right? And you're in this moment with your kiddo and frustrated. I would have more of a defined schedule because sometimes that means that there are too many choices, their day's too wide open or that section of the day is too wide open. And sometimes kids feel lost even though there are so many choices, you might need to make it more defined. Like on the visual schedule that's on my website, it's like there's creative time, there's electronics time, there's um, independent play, and you may give a few different choices or a space that has certain choices in it. Um, things like that, or maybe it's outside time or something like that. So you're taking away the element for boredom because you're providing what they can and cannot do. Even if you're giving them like a few choices, um, that way it just helps them be a little bit more successful. I would redefine your house rules. So redefine them so that the six-year-old doesn't feel like they're being targeted either. So it's just, um, hey, I, I realized some of our house rules weren't really clear let's talk about it and because you have a four-year-old definitely have pictures with each rule so it's something like be respectful be kind be helpful be responsible but i wouldn't do more than like four or five rules because you have that four-year-old kiddo and that's going to be like at capacity for them at like three or four rules probably um and then maybe sit down with the six-year-olds and say like separately on a different day and say i noticed you know that you kind of tend to say some unkind things to your four-year-old brother. What's going on? Like, what's happening? I just want to understand. You're not in trouble. I just want to help understand because it seems like it's not really helping you get what you were hoping for, and it, it seems like it's hurting his feelings, right? So let's talk about that and talk about the underlying issue because there is something else happening. Maybe the four-year-old's you know, invading their space, using their items, things like that, not respecting you know, their boundaries. So it depends on their age and their level of communication. Um, but I'm gonna assume that their language processing skills are okay, which means what they're understanding, even though they can't communicate it all back to you maybe. Um, so when they hit you, you're gonna say, oh, remember hitting hurts. We use gentle hands, gentle. And then move forward and move on to what you're doing. If they hit you because they're angry with you, then your response would change to something like, um, it's okay to be mad, it's not okay to hit. Hitting hurts. You may squeeze the pillow and we can take some deep breaths. Or you know, you can provide two positive choices. Maybe you have a break space um, where you guys can go together to try to calm their body. Because um, they need to know it is okay to be mad at you. They can be mad at you. They just can't be hurtful. So I usually say it's okay to be mad, it's not okay to be hurtful. But if they're a toddler and they're a little bit younger, you might need to define that more. So it's okay to be mad, it's not okay to hit. We use gentle hands. Gentle looks like this, gentle. So maybe it's you can squeeze the pillow or you can squeeze my pointer finger, right? So you're still giving them that physical piece that they need and then you're gonna go through de-escalation strategies, deep breaths and things like that. Maybe it's they squeeze the pillow really tight, squeeze, 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 take a deep breath in while you're squeezing, squeeze, 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 and let it out and let go, right? So you're getting that de-escalation piece in with it and then you do a couple breaths after they're done with the pillow or squeezing whatever as well. Um, Cause you're trying to, at first you kind of need to replace the behavior with something that's a little bit less intense. Um, and then after that, maybe they won't need to squeeze something at all in like a week or two, right? Um, it's just about their skill set and where, where they're at with their social emotional skills. Well, I would eliminate using the term no, stop, don't, those negative phrases, because um, that's not the way their brains work at that age. Um, they need to be told what you do expect from them. Um, and as far as the gentle parenting style, it depends on how you're implementing it and for what situations. So gentle and passive are different. You can be gentle and assertive at the same time. So it's not, we don't hit, okay, oh, hitting hurts, that's passive. So instead, really reflect on your tone too. Not saying that you don't do this, but um, I think a lot of times when we look at gentle parenting, we tend to be a little bit more passive when we're not intending to be. 
Um, and passive means that it's a choice and it's optional and your kiddo is trying to then decode what you mean and what you actually said because they're different now and kids can't decode that. Um, it's too it's too much. So I would m maybe start reflecting on your tone and make sure you're being assertive and not passive when you're using those phrases. So it's hitting hurts. We use gentle hands. And then you could say, if you choose to hit me again, then I'm putting you down. Or if you choose to hit me again, then you're choosing to play on the floor and not with me, right? Because I need space now because my body hurts. And it's not a punishment, it's you have a choice to make. But at 22 months, that may be a little bit difficult, so be patient. You may need to give like a, like a warning, like a precursor. If you choose to hit me again, then that means you're gonna play on the floor, not with mommy. Hitting hurts. Use gentle hands with me, or you can play on the floor by yourself. Um, make sure, again, that you're using that assertive voice, and then you're going to make sure you are phrasing it in a way where it doesn't sound optional. No pleases, no thank yous, and no okay at the end, because those all also give the illusion that it's an option when it's not. Um, then after that, your child still is allowed to say, I don't want to, or no, right? Because they're gonna, they don't want to do it. And so make sure that when they say that, they're not getting extra time, extra whatever. It's, I hear you don't want to do this. You're validating emotions. Right now, this is what we are doing. What can I do to help you, right? Or maybe you decide instead, like if he gets to the point where he can't really communicate or you feel like it's going to be a power struggle and you're, you guys are both going to be stuck, then maybe instead of what can I do to help, because he might say, I don't know, or he might say nothing, then instead you're going to say, I hear you, it's really hard to do things you don't want to do. Do you want to do this alone or do you want a little help to get started? So those are two positive choices still, but the choice is alone or teamwork. Now keep in mind, you didn't say how much you're going to do. You said, do you want to do it alone and be independent, right? So it's still positive. Or do you want a little help to get started and we'll be a team? And that way you get the ball rolling with them and it doesn't seem so daunting. Um, and then I would always look at like, is it the same tasks all the time? Is it the same piece of day that your kiddo is having a tough time following directions? Because if so, maybe it's the event or the activity that they really don't like. That's called a non-preferred activity, something they would prefer to not do. So for that instance, make sure you have a preferred activity afterwards. So then you can do your two choices and then say, the sooner we get this done, the sooner we get to blank. And I know you really enjoy doing that. Let's see how quick we can get this done so we can go do blank sooner. That is common with siblings that it's going to be like that. Instead, I would maybe consider before they start play together, say remember, it's not a competition between you guys. If it becomes a competition, we can't play. So that's the boundary. And then you can say, it looks like this might be turning into a competition. I heard blank right and kind of restate a roundabout like what they said then you can say if this happens remember we can't play because it's not safe so that's your boundary and if being safe is one of your rules that you've stated in your house rules prior to that you can you know restate that then this is why this is a boundary so you're giving them all the tools they need to be successful um, you may also need to say like you can play this way or this way instead Right, like I noticed you started to say this, you can play it like this or like that. Those would both be more helpful choices that, that means that you guys could stay and play together. Remember, if you choose to make this a competition, then we can't play here anymore. Um, and then follow through with that. And they may be upset. I hear you, this is really hard. Remember, you chose to blank, so that means we can't play here right now because it's not safe. We can try again later or we can try again tomorrow. So it's not an I told you so moment, but still a teaching moment. No, um, and here's why. So first I'll start by saying punishment is the wrong word for the teaching and parenting style that I teach here. Um, I focus on discipline, which is different. I know it just sounds like it's a similar word, but punishing is something that is meant to be hurtful. Let me explain. So spanking is a punishment. It is meant to be hurtful. 
taking something away is meant to be hurtful. It's like, you did this, so now you should be upset too because you made someone else upset. It doesn't teach anything. I know that we think it does because in our heads that's the way like it should work, but it's not related to the incident, which is why it's a punishment that's meant to hurt. Discipline would be something like, hey, I noticed you were being not safe with the controller, right? Maybe a video game controller or a TV remote or whatever. I noticed you were not being safe with the controller. If you choose to be unsafe with it again, then that means you may not have TV time because you need to be safe with it to have that privilege or to be able to use it. And then if they're unsafe with it, I noticed you were being unsafe. That means TV is not a choice right now. I'm sorry that this is happening and that this is so hard for you. We can try again another day or later this afternoon or, you know, whatever. But that would be a discipline, like a natural consequence. It is directly related. So in terms of like adult life, um, I love this analogy because I just think it's fitting. So if you decide to not pay a certain bill, right, like a water bill, let's say, and your water gets shut off, that's a natural consequence. You know what choice you made that's directly related to that happening, right? If you choose not to pay your water, but you paid your electricity bill, right? So you didn't pay water bill, and then someone shuts off your electricity, you're going to be mad, right? Because you paid that bill, but you still made a mistake because you didn't pay the water. So it makes more sense for the water to be shut off, but a punishment would be, well, you chose not to pay your water, so now you don't get electricity either. Punishment. It doesn't teach anything, and it makes your kiddo more mad. It doesn't help. And that's, that's not what we're there for. For them, we have to teach them and model how to use you know, these social and emotional skills in a healthy way. What should we do when we're frustrated? Um, so instead, think of a natural consequence that could happen. What is naturally occurring? I see you are throwing your toys. If you choose to keep throwing them, these toys may not be a choice right now. We may need to go somewhere else. It doesn't mean they don't have toys all day. It means not in that space, in that moment. Or maybe it means you guys take a break together. I see your body is having trouble being safe right now with the toys, and I notice they're being thrown. Remember, toys are for playing, not for throwing. If you choose to throw toys, then we may need to go take a break together so we can calm down and take some deep breaths. And it's not a timeout. Check out my videos on timeout if you would like, but it's more like a break or a time in. Because again, when they're having those super big feelings, you don't want to tell them that they're alone dealing with those feelings and that you don't like them for doing that, which is what we do when we send them to a timeout and isolate them. So instead, you're going to say, you know, something like what I had just mentioned, like, I notice that you're having a tough time, blah, blah, blah. You can choose to use your toys in a safe way and stay here, or you can choose to keep being unsafe with them by throwing them, right, for example. And then we'll go take a little break so we can calm down and find a way to be safe again. Hitting is going to be the easier skill to replace than biting. Biting is really hard and most of the time both of those things are about a lack of communication. So try to remember in those moments that behavior is communication. They're probably frustrated. They're frustrated and they don't know how to express it yet. So even though what they're doing is hurting, try to keep your calm right and try to be proactive in being there before the 19 month old hits or bites another person like another child right um so just do your best in that way um as far as like stopping the hitting instead of thinking about stopping the hit think about what's happening how can i help them build their communication skills so that they don't need to hit anymore right because it's not about don't hit don't hit it's about what's happening that makes you feel like you need to hit. So we have to figure that out because the 19 month old can't communicate that effectively to us yet. So it may be like in the moment, right? Like maybe they're swatting at you or hitting you. And you say, remember hitting hurts. See how my face didn't change a ton. You're not gonna react drastically. Remember hitting hurts. Gentle hands, gentle hands. 
show me what you need. Show me. Show me. Or you're mad. You seem mad. Right? If, like, you know what's happening, if they're upset with you, if they couldn't have something, you wanted that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really hard. And then follow up with two choices. You can have this or that. Which one? This or that. See how I'm using, like, objects, too, to kind of frame their reference? Because sometimes words aren't enough, especially because they can't communicate effectively with words anyway. So you're going to provide a lot of different modalities. Words, pictures, um, maybe you do it in a sing-song voice that's, that changes the way they process it um, with their auditory skills. And then you're going to provide visual, like, objects, too, whenever you can, so that you're really getting that understanding piece. As far as biting, you're going to have to be as proactive as possible with it. Um, if they bite you, um, there are strategies out there for how to safely have kiddos release because you, you shouldn't pull away when that happens. And then again, make sure you're not really reacting on your face and just say, like take a breath if you need to and say, biting hurts. Biting hurts. You can be mad. You may not hurt. Are you going to use this or that? And maybe give them something to squeeze if you know what they're upset about or something. But then figure out what was happening because something triggered that bite. I understand where you're coming from. Um, however, there is lots of research that shows the opposite, actually. Um, so basically, punishment, such as like spanking or taking away objects, they either have no effect in teaching the skill you want that, them to teach, right? or to learn from that moment, they either have no effect at all or they can be hurtful. So while you're right that they are not always hurtful, they're not doing what you want them to do either. So they're really pointless. What they actually do is they make us feel like we're doing something. Usually punishments like, for example, spanking, um, they happen when we are frustrated, we feel out of control in the situation. And so exerting that, that power um, it, it makes us feel like we're doing something to help the situation. And then the kiddo reacts in an adverse way, like crying or being upset or whatever. So we feel like they learned the lesson, but they really learned to not get caught. And they didn't learn the why behind it, which is the problem. I hope that made sense. And I'm really glad that you brought that up. This can be really, really difficult because you don't know the context right? And maybe you already left for the day and you don't have an opportunity to ask the teacher about it. And it could have been like a swat at a toy, right? Um, at daycare, I'm assuming they're less than four years old, um, which also means there's a communication barrier with a lot of kiddos. They're all at different levels of communication. So keep that in mind too. I would say something like, oh, I hear um, someone hit you. How do you feel about that? So you're going to follow up with some questions, something like, how do you feel about that? Or tell me more, what happened? Something like that, but you're not really going to react much. You want to know how they feel, because if you say, what do you mean someone hit you? They're going to automatically be mad, even if it didn't really bother them. Or maybe they are very worked up and they say, yeah, so-and-so hit me, and it's like they're reliving it and they have all these emotions. You could say something like, it seems like that was really difficult for you. Did it make you sad or maybe mad? Talk to me, what happened? So you're still getting to the bottom of it. And then you can say like, well, what happened after that? Was there anyone around? You know, did you, did, like which teacher could you have asked maybe instead? Like maybe they didn't tell a teacher or something, um, or maybe a teacher didn't notice it if it was just a small swat or something in like a passing during like a free play moment or something. Um, so maybe say like, well, what could we do next time if that happens? You know, what could we do differently? So maybe it's giving them step by step, say, don't hit me, right? Because they can do that. They can say, this is my body, don't hit me. And it depends on your kiddo's level of communication too. So if they can't say all that, they could just say hitting hurts um, or something along those lines. And if the child still doesn't listen, then give them a step two. What should you do if you say hitting hurts or don't touch me and, and they go to hit you again? What should you do? Could you move your body away? 
You could, right? So you can step away again and say, don't hit me. And then if they're still coming at you, who is in your classroom that you can always ask for help? Who's there for you? Hmm. So that way you're not just telling them what to do, you're making them an active participant. So they're more likely to remember that stuff in that moment when they need it. If she doesn't listen at all, uh, no judgment, but that sometimes means that you may not be as consistent as you think with enforcing boundaries or stating boundaries. Um, so I would first reflect on the tone of voice you're using and how you're giving directions. Um, because usually there's, there's a miscommunication there. And it is way easier to change the way we are giving information out than to try to change your response. Because if we change how we give out the information, it's going to change your child's response. It takes time and consistency, which is hard, um, but it does change it. So I know you said this comment with the intention to be hurtful, but I think there is a good point here of discussion. Um, so I am going to bring it up. You said, are we raising weak and soft? Um, well, you said a hurtful word, but um, basically saying liberals. Um, and that's actually a comment that I've heard quite a bit. And the misconception with gentle parenting and conscious parenting is that the child gets whatever they want, and that's not the case. However, when these strategies first came out and people tried to implement them, because it all sounds great on paper, right? But like I was saying earlier, when these books and these articles tell you how to implement them, they don't talk about what happens when you get pushed back. What happens when the child says, uh-uh, I'm not doing it, right? Or you see some behaviors because the hardest part is dealing with the aftermath. So you set the boundary. You gave the direction. You set the limit, right? You still do that with gentle parenting and conscious parenting. You still do that. You just do it in a more healthy way. Because as an adult, you can't go up to your coworkers and say, you know, you're going to do this now because I said so, right? That's not how it works. So gentle parenting and conscious parenting talks more about, you know, setting them up for the real world. But we need to remember that a child's brain doesn't have to be ready for the adult world at four years old, at eight years old, at 10 years old. You teach them a set of skills based on where they are at now. Meet them where they're at with their skill level, just like you would for any other subject. Math, science, social studies. You don't expect kids to know how to add when they are two because they're going to need to know how to do addition as an adult. How are they going to live, right? But we think of social emotional skills in that way, and it doesn't make sense when you really lay it out plain and simple. It doesn't make sense, but we do it all the time. And so the comment I get is, you know, oh, we're ra raising these soft people, these liberals. Here's the thing. We're actually raising stronger people who don't need to punch a wall when they get mad, who don't need to get in fights when someone says something rude to them. Instead, they can be aware of something happening within them, a feeling, and say, you know what, that was rude, I'm going to walk away. You know, they don't have this loss of control with their emotions. They can feel the feeling, not let it take over and consume them. And they have all these coping strategies then because they've been taught from a young age. I am live every Wednesday night around 8 o'clock. Um, well, it depends on what they're lying about, but mainly I would just touch on it like in a moment when they're not lying and say, hey, I've been noticing things have been a little sneaky lately. Remember that you can trust me and I can trust you. I can tell you anything and you can tell me anything. I make mistakes sometimes and so do you, and it's okay. It doesn't always mean it'll be trouble. It just means it's a mistake, it's just an oops, and then we'll try to fix it if we can. And then we can learn. Um, and then make sure the next time something happens, you try to like catch them before or set them up for success. So you're not going to say, did you do this? You're going to say, hey, I noticed this happened. Let's talk about it because you know it was them, right? So you're not setting them up for failure because you know that they tend to kind of fib. And then when it happens and they say, no, 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 you can say, oh, I didn't say who did it. I just said, let's talk about it because it's in our house. It's here, you know. Um, so let's just talk about it. Remember, this is how we use this item, right? Or whatever it might be. So you're going to reteach the expectation without placing blame and guilt because that doesn't need to be there. 
because that's what the kiddo's doing. They're trying to avoid blame and guilt. that they, The blame that other people bestow and the guilt that they feel when they make that mistake. They're trying to avoid it. So don't give it out, right? Use it as a teachable moment so then you're going to teach the skill you want. So next time if you want to color, remember crayons are here and we color on, yeah, on paper. Um, I'm going to grab some sponges and then we can clean this up together. Right, so it's not you did this and now you're gonna clean it. It's, you know, you're roundabout the way saying that, but you're saying it in a more loving way that doesn't place blame there. Okay, so before you even get in the car to go to the store, you're gonna say, hey, we're going to the grocery store. I've been noticing that you really want candies or, you know, be specific with what she may want when we go there. Today, we won't have time or money to get that. We will not have time. I do have a shopping list for you though, and there are things you're responsible for finding, so I need you to have your spy goggles on. Do you have them on? Oh, perfect, they might be invisible. Go ahead, put them on. Okay, when we're in the store, I need you to be extra focused. You have to find this many things, right? So you give her a job when she's there so she feels useful, and try to make sure that one of those last items is something near the checkout, as, as close as possible, right? And then she gets to hold it and hand it to the cashier. So that's still another job. And that eliminates, well, not eliminates because she's still going to notice it. But say, oh, remember, you have a job right now. Your job is to hand the cashier what? Yeah, the lettuce. Do you have the lettuce? Right? Um, and then, so it does take extra preparation on your part. But it's also going to eliminate or diffuse most of that meltdown that would have happened in the grocery store. Like I said, you really need to talk about it before you even get in the car and then maybe even again when you get to the grocery store before you go in say, remember, do we have time to get junk food today? Do we have time or money to get junk food today? Nope, and I know that's hard because we both really want it, right? We can't this time. Take a deep breath. We've got this. And do you have your list? You have your list of stuff, right? Oh, perfect. You have your list and I have my list. We both have jobs to do. Let's see how quick we can get this shopping trip done, right? Maybe you set like a timer on your phone or something and then periodically check it throughout the store and like maybe it's the stopwatch feature. Like let's see how quick we can get this done or whatever. Um, so you're making it more fun and you're making it interactive for your kiddo. So that just means their social skills and emotional skills, like their regulation piece isn't there yet which means we still have to build that skill. So you're still gonna be consistent, but instead of like a punishment or getting escalated after, I don't know how you respond after they say no or you know provide that pushback, dig their heels in, um, but you're gonna follow up with two choices. Could be a choice of, like I said before, movement, a choice of a color of something, a choice of time, um, or a choice of alone or together to complete the task. So alone or, I usually say teamwork because it makes a bonding moment. Um, and then they're still probably going to say no. And then I do this thing where I say, well, you can choose or I can help you choose. It's up to you. But it's not threatening. That's the important part. Because a lot of parents will do that and then say, you better pick three, two, one. But that's threatening and it's aggressive. So instead I say, well, you can choose or I can help you choose. I'll count down from five. And when my hand does this, that means zero. And you can pick. But if you say nothing, or if you don't pick, then I can help you pick. Deep breath, you got this. <sighs> Zero. Oh, I don't hear your body saying anything. Are you going to choose? Remember, this or that. All right, it looks like you need some help. I'm going to choose blank, right? So I've provided the two choices. They dug their heels in because they want to see what's going to happen and I helped them choose. They don't get to choose again. So if they say, well, I wanted the other one, I hear you wanted the other thing. Remember next time that you can choose, but if, if I get down to zero, then I hope you choose. And this time that's what happened. All right, let's go. And then you implement that choice in a respectful, loving way, and then follow up with another two choices as soon as you can so that they don't feel like they lost all their power. But 
it just means that every kid's on a different timeline. Like you said, you've been consistent and they still don't. Try to switch up your strategy or your wording just a little bit. Make it a little bit more playful when you can. Like with your choices sometimes. I love choices of movement that are fun. I pick like, are we going to hop like a kangaroo or tiptoe like sneaky spies, right? Something like that. And I make sure one of them is something I can respectfully help their body do if they choose to dig their heels in. Or I'll do like wiggle like an opt octopus so I can literally just take their arms and we like blah, 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 so that by the time we get to that next location, most of the time they're holding back a smile like they're trying not to. Um, so it just takes away that power struggle moment. Um, I would address it with the teacher and just say that this is something your kiddo's saying is a problem um, and how can you be a team to work through it because you're worried that he won't be building the relationships he needs to build. Um, so the teacher can find a way to bring it up in a non-threatening way so that it's still not targeting him. So maybe there are like classroom family building activities that the teacher implements or um, maybe you and your kiddo also ha just have a one-on-one -on -one talk at home and say, I hear that this is happening and that can be really, really hard. Next time someone says that, you can say, I felt like I needed help and so-and-so wasn't respecting my choices. I'm sorry if that upset you. Um, and make sure your kiddo understands that sometimes making friends is really hard and sometimes kids don't understand why you did something, they just think you're a tattletale. And the truth was you weren't being a tattletale, you needed help, right? Because someone wasn't being respectful to you. And when you need help, that's what adults are for. And you weren't trying to get them in trouble, you just needed some help to get them to be respectful to you. I hate them. Point cards, the, um, the color system where you go from green, yellow, red, I hate them. Um, and they, they're they like shaming to kids and they're more of a punishment than they are a teaching tool and I don't know why most public schools still use them. They are not helpful and they, just like a punishment, they're not doing what we think they're doing. So this is a big piece of conscious parenting because we need to be reflective of why that's embarrassing to us. Why do we care what public people that don't know you think, right? So we need to be more aware of ourselves and being embarrassed because what happens is we usually get embarrassed and then we react in a kind of yucky way or a way we didn't want to because we're embarrassed. We're having a big feeling and our emotions are elevated and when that happens, we react in a way that's not quite what we would typically do. Um, so first you need to kind of reflect on that and say, okay, why am I embarrassed by this? How can I help myself through this? My kiddo's not trying to embarrass me, they're just having a hard time. I know that I'm a good parent. It does not matter what the people around me think. I am not here to please them, right? And then after that, the rest just kind of happens. Do what you would typically do at home. You're gonna validate those feelings. It seems like you're having a really hard time. You seem really mad, right? You wanted blank, right? Or you didn't want to be here, or whatever the case may be. I'm really sorry that this is so hard for you. We can choose to set a timer for how long we have left and try to beat the timer or I can give you some jobs to do while we're here because I could use some help. What would you like to do? Do you want to set a timer or do you want some jobs? Take a breath. You've got this. <sighs> I'm right here for you. You can handle this. And then move forward from there. I would pause what you're doing. Don't just try to go through the motions. Pause and be in that moment with your kiddo because they're having a hard time. They're not trying to give you a hard time. They're just having a hard time and they're not trying to embarrass you, they just need your support through that feeling. That can be very difficult, and honestly, you're gonna have some roadblocks and you're not gonna see the results you want with behavioral things that are happening if you guys aren't on the same page. I would try something like, hey, I've been noticing X behavior, right? So you're not talking about strategies that you guys are using, you're talking about a behavior you see. I've noticed that when I do this, sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. Have you seen anything that works? I want to try to teach them a better skill so that this doesn't happen so often. And then you're gonna open a dia dialogue, like I heard about this strategy. Would you be open to trying this for two weeks so that we both do it and then we'll kind of track the progress and see how it's going? Because this behavior is really like, I feel like we're at the end of our ropes, right? 
So that way it's a communication thing and you're not talking about my strategy versus your strategy or parenting style. We're saying this is the behavior we want to be different. So we need to build a skill. What strategy can we agree on to try for two weeks consistently? Because if you try different things and you both are consistent with different things, it's still gonna be not effective. It's not gonna do anything or it's gonna do little, right? Because it's not consistent then. Because the kiddo knows that if I do this, maybe A will happen and maybe B will happen. So they're gonna keep doing it because the end result is different sometimes. Um, before you leave the house, talk about and reinforce the rule that you have about parking lots and driveways. So it's, we hold hands until your grown up says you can go to a certain place or we hold hands until we're inside the building or the vehicle or whatever. If you choose to run away, that is unsafe and I will stop you. I cannot let you run away, it is unsafe. So then the rule for leaving is, okay, I need your hand. If you do not hold my hand, we are going to stand here until we can do this. This is how we are safe when we are in the driveway or in a parking lot. So that way you're putting the boundary in place before you even open the door. So you're setting them up for success. And if they try to wriggle out of your hand, you can say, you just pause for a moment if you can in a safe way. I mean, in parking lots, it's a little bit different. So maybe while you're walking, say, I feel your hand trying to pull away. Remember, this is our rule so that you stay safe and I stay safe. Can you count my fingers while we walk? Right, something like that. Give them a job while they do it. Um, and then you can also say, you know, I'm helping you be safe, but I need some help to be safe too. Can you give my hand two squeezes if you are willing to help me stay safe? Oh, I felt two squeezes. I feel so loved that you're gonna help me stay safe too. I'm so glad we can be there for each other. Right, so you're kind of reframing uh, what the, the goal is too and it, makes them feel helpful and useful. Then you're also teaching them like, maybe you're gonna use some self-talk and say, I'm gonna keep you safe. Oh, here I am, I'm gonna pause and we're gonna look for cars. Do you see any? Are you looking for cars so that I'm safe too? Oh, perfect. So you're actually teaching them like how to be safe in a parking lot as well. You're building that skill. If you check out my videos on timeout, I have two of them. It's more of um, some strategies in books call it a time in, but I like to call it a break because it's more relatable to adult life because you can model that too and say at work I needed to take a break because I was feeling frustrated. And it's a place that you go together and it's always an option. It's not a forced thing and you stay with them and help them work through their emotion with de-escalation strategies and you're gonna have tools in this break space and the whole area is introduced to them before they need it, so in calm times and you introduce each tool that's in it like I say tool, but um, it's like a stress ball, you know, maybe a book about big feelings, um, a sensory bottle that they can shake up and watch all the glitter settle to the bottom. There may be some feeling face cards in there so they can identify what feeling they're having. There's gonna be some visuals in there about breathing activities that they can do to calm themselves down. And maybe like a pillow or something soft that they can either snuggle up with or squeeze if they need to. Um, I like to put it sort of in a corner so you can use walls to post things and also because sometimes kids need something physical so I'll say you know let's try to push the wall and you can put hand cutouts and tape them up on the wall and you get them to push as hard as they can so they're using those large muscles too and then once they're done with each like pushing the wall moment um, then you stop and do a deep breath something along those lines. It depends on the kiddo really because um, remember that ASD is a spectrum and no two kiddos are the same. Um, so you just wanna focus on replacement behaviors, replacement skills, and what you can do to eliminate the opportunity to elope. For those of you that don't know, eloping is a term that um, most public school system use for escaping, like running away out of the room, out of the building, that type of thing. So if you feel like you're threatening them, you do need to be reflective on um, the tone of voice you're using because if you're threatening him that's aggressive and you're not gonna get the result you want anyway you create a power struggle because then he's gonna dig his heels in more and say mm -mm, not a chance so 
And I understand what you're saying. Sometimes it feels like the two choice method is difficult or maybe you feel stuck like there isn't another choice you can like provide. It really depends on what situations it's happening with. I'm guessing it's just with like directions and stuff. Um, so like, I guess I'll try to give an example. So if your direction is about cleaning his room, right, or cleaning up his toys, and your threat feels like clean up your toys, come on, it's time to clean them up, that's gonna dig in heels and make him not wanna do it. So instead, try something like it's time to clean up your toys. Do you wanna start with the action figures or the Legos? You choose or I'll help you choose. That's two choices, he's still cleaning up the room. He's still probably gonna say no, but then you could say, oh, I hear you saying no. You can choose or I can help you choose. That's also a choice. So you've provided two options for two positive choices. Um, and then you're probably gonna have to follow through with that, which doesn't mean the two choices isn't working. It's just meaning your kiddo's testing how consistent you are and if you say what you mean. And like, if the words you're saying match up with what you actually do. So I would just make sure you're being extremely consistent and make sure that your tone is assertive. It's matter of fact. It's the same as the wall is blue, right? It, it's time to clean up your room. It, you have to say it in a matter of fact way or else you lose effectiveness. So instead of saying, no, you're not or something like that. And remember that school's not a choice either. Like he can't refuse to go, he's, he's going. Um, so we're gonna acknowledge the fear and then talk about how to work through fear. Cause fear is not always a bad thing. It might just mean like there's something he's uncomfortable with or something that may have happened and now he might be embarrassed or he's not sure of his skills, right? Or something like that. He doesn't feel like he's able to do something. So we're gonna acknowledge the fear. Be non-reactive. So say it's spiders, right? I hear that you're afraid of spiders. What about them is a little bit scary for you? What's scary? Sometimes I'm scared of things too. So that way you're not judging, you're just saying, I have things I'm scared of too. They make me feel sometimes nervous. And then identify where the feeling is within your body. So when I feel scared, sometimes my belly gets really tight and sometimes my face gets warm and sometimes I even cry a little bit or I want a hug from someone. What happens to your body when you feel scared? So that way it's less about being scared and more about what does your body feel like? Okay, now that I know what it feels like, I can give you some coping strategies. So when my body feels scared and I have that tight belly feeling, this is what I do to help myself feel better because being scared isn't a bad thing. Um, it's just something that we have to work through and it means something's happening that might make us a little uncomfortable or it might be something new like swim or something like that. So maybe he said he was afraid of spiders, but he means something else. Like you said, school, swim, whatever. I hear that going to school today is kind of scary for you. Talk to me about it. Um, and then maybe get a dialogue going. Encourage him and let him know that, you know, school isn't a choice. We are going today. And I am here for you to help you work through your scared feeling because there's lots we can do to help our bodies feel better you know, something along those lines. And then do some deep breaths, and then maybe when you do drop off, you can acknowledge to the teacher too, um, okay, they said they were feeling a little scared about school today, I'm not sure if something happened this week that made them uncomfortable or something, um, but I told them an option for them could be drawing a picture to help them feel better at a time when it's convenient for the class, I hope that's okay, type of a thing, so that you and the teacher have um, a connection too, and that you're on the same page. So that's when I'll say, you can choose or I can help you choose. And I repeat the, the choices. And then I kind of just pause and like wait, like I'm, like I'm listening. Um, and I maintain that eye contact in a non-threatening way. Oh, I don't hear anything. Or you know, I don't hear you making a choice. Which one, this or that, tell me, tell me or point. You know, if it's like an object or something, but tell me which one. And then I pause for another couple seconds, not long. Say, it looks like you're having trouble choosing. You can choose, or I can help you choose. My hand, I have five fingers on it. And when I say five, four, three, two, one, and I get to zero, that means you need some help and I'm gonna help you choose, because I will know that this is hard for you. Five, 
four. And sometimes I say the numbers and sometimes I don't. If you think it's going to give your kiddo more anxiety, don't say it. Just, just put your hand up. But remember, it's not to be um, threatening. It's just to give them a time frame of how long they have to choose. And then usually around three or two, deep breath, you got this. Which one? <sighs> Okay, I'm gonna help you choose. We're gonna do blank. And then I help them follow through with that. So I make sure my choices that I offer, there is at least one that I can help them do in a respectful way. So for example, if it's a choice of movement to get to what we're doing next, like it's time to clean your room, you can hop there like a kangaroo, or you can wiggle there like an octopus. Um, and I'm gonna choose one or the other. Wiggling like an octopus is less strain on their body and mine if I have to help them. Because I can just take their arms and wiggle them a little bit and I might say like, oh, it looks like you need help. I'm gonna choose octopus. And usually the kiddo will say, I wanted a kangaroo. Oh, I hear you wanted a kangaroo. This time, it was tough for you to choose so I helped you choose. There'll be other choices, don't worry. You know, or something along those lines. Or this time it was too tough for you to choose, so I was there to help you. Next time you'll have another choice. And I'll say, all right, here we go. We're going to be an octopus together. And I take their arms and we just kind of, blah, 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 and I try to make it a fun thing. So even though it may start as a bit of a power struggle because your kiddo's trying to say, no, absolutely not, I'm not doing it, you are showing them in a loving and respectful way and also incorporating some fun that we're still gonna do it, but it doesn't have to be yucky. And then as soon as we get to that location where the chore is or where whatever is, then I try to have two choices again. All right, we made it. We used teamwork to be an octopus and now it's time to pick up the toys. Are you gonna start with the red toy or the blue toy? Right? Oh, which one are you gonna pick? Oh, here I go. My hand's going toward the red one. Are you okay with the blue one? All right, perfect, let's do teamwork. Let's, let's race to see how quick we can finish, you know, and put all the toys away, something like that, so that you can still make it a fun, playful experience, even though you are enforcing a rule. As you enforce the rule, like if you're talking about when I said like the red one or the blue one, it wouldn't mean they watch. It means, oh, I'm gonna do the blue one, and then maybe I grab it real quick, say, okay, your turn, and it might mean hand over hand helping them grab the red one, or it might mean, grabbing the red one, putting it in their hand, and helping them hold it to place it in the bucket. And then it's, whoa, look at us, we did teamwork, and we, we both put in one toy each. Where are we gonna go next? Do you wanna do Legos or, you know, dolls next? Which one are we putting away, Legos or dolls? You pick or I'll help you pick. <sighs> Legos, here we go. And then I'm not gonna provide as many choices if they're still digging their heels in. I'm gonna hand over hand help them do it. Which means even if you don't like this, this is what we're doing, but it's not in this like forceful, gross, like power struggle way. I'm still gonna make it playful and I'm gonna encourage them with each um, handful that they do. Even if I'm helping them do that handful, I'm still saying, wow, we did teamwork. And then if they choose to take a handful, on their own, which they probably will by the time, like by the end of the cleanup session, they probably will, and I'm gonna encourage that even more. Oh my goodness, I just saw how many pieces you just put away. This is incredible. You did that all by yourself, you know? And then say, I wonder what else you can do all by yourself too. You are growing up so fast, and I'm gonna place way more attention on when, when they did it independently. That way they're more likely to do it again. Great question, and it can be really difficult. Um, so they're four, and you're saying they tried to hit. So you're gonna block the hit lovingly, right? Gentle hand, because they're four, you don't need to exert force. Block the hit. You seem really mad. You can be mad at me. You can say, I'm mad at you, or I don't like this. You may not hit. Hitting hurts. It's okay to be mad. I get mad sometimes, too. <sighs> You got this, we'll get through it together. Something along those lines. Um, I appreciate you all. And again, if you want to book a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me, it's 
similar to this, but it's way more specific and we get that back and forth exchange. Um, and we really cover lots of details about behaviors and things that you have happening in your home and strategies and things that work for you and your family specifically. Because while I talk about some strategies here, it may not work for your family or you may want something else or you may say that seems like a lot for me. I'm not sure if I can implement it the right way and then I can tailor it to suit your needs. Um, so that's more of what my appointments are. And if you don't feel like you need a one-on-one -on -one appointment, but you'd be open to putting up some flyers in your local businesses or daycare facilities or something, um, you can email me at bloomparentingsolutions at gmail.com and I can send one to you.